Professor Fauchier, you present some very interesting data on thrombus formation on left atrial appendage occlusion devices. Can you tell us a little bit about this study? Yes, the study um, was uh, in France. It's, uh, it was a multi-center study in uh, uh, initially seven and now eight centers, and it's about uh, 450 patients. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the study was some kind of real-life study. Uh, I mean, it was not uh, uh, a fully high experience in, in centers only implanted for that. It's all the centers, more or less, in France doing this type of procedure. Mm -hmm. And the second aspect is that it was unrestricted by the use of one specific device. It's the, the, the two main devices uh, were implanted in, in this series. So patient with the watchman device and patient with the amplazor devices. And, and we tried to see the outcomes of these patients uh, based, based on the characteristics uh, and try to see one specific point, which is the issue of thrombus formation on device during the follow-up. Uh, you know that the, the, the incidence of these events is uh, debated and the significance is also debated because some, some physicians said there is no meaning, it will spontaneously disappear. Some others consider this is a, a thrombus is not a binning condition. So th this was the purpose of uh, our study. And uh, so in the patients where you did see some thrombus formation, was there any association with risk of stroke after that? Yes, absolutely. So the, the first point uh, was the, the, the incidence that we saw, and it was uh, uh, between four and 6%, uh, it was quite similar with the two devices, mm. uh, but 6%, it's rather at the higher range of what has been described, so it's not uncommon. And, uh, and, and not all the patients uh, have some imaging, so it may be uh, even higher when you, you, you consider the, the percentage on patients with imaging, uh, first point. Second point, there were some predictors of uh, thrombus formation, uh, and the, 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 the main point was that patients with a history of stroke uh, uh, had a higher risk of thrombus formation. So mm -hmm. patients with a capacity to produce thrombus, they, they yeah. had already thrombus and then they have a new thrombus formation on the device mm -hmm. uh, mainly. And second, we uh, found that uh, anti-thrombotic therapy may play a role. There were very various scenarios for anti-thrombotic therapies in all the patients, some with antiplatelet, other with no antiplatelet, some with dual antiplatelet, anticoagulation, then even some patients with no antithrombotic therapy at all. And we found that dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with a, independently associated with a lower risk of thrombus formation, which is uh, a, a first result. Then the, the, the significance of thrombus formation, and indeed uh, this patient, they had thereafter a higher risk of stroke or TIA and uh, it's uh, significant in the univariate analysis and it's mm. even uh, more significant in multivariate adjustment in these very sick patients and yeah. you see that the risk of stroke is is more than five times higher in this patient and it's highly significant so there is uh, uh, clearly a worse prognosis in this patient yeah. and the finally when at the end of the day you consider um, what is what are the predictors of stroke in patient after LAD occlusion? Mm -hmm. You find that vascular disease and it may be atherosclerotic uh, is a predictor of stroke, and the second only predictor of stroke during follow-up uh, is patient with thrombus formation on device. So um, our conclusion is, is that it, it's not a benign finding and it, it's uh, associated with clearly a worse prognosis and probably we have to work on identifying that, closely following patient and working on the best anti-traumatic therapy to avoid all of these events. Yeah, As you say, this is an observational study and observational studies are very good for generating hypotheses and yeah. certainly this looks like it's generated plenty. Um, so um, just to understand what, 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 what sort of patients were recruited in, w into this study because I know there's quite a lot of varying practice around the world about which types of patients are offered appendage occlusion devices? So there were patients recruited from uh, the general uh, population in cardiology department. Mm. They were quite sick patients, high risk patients. The indication, uh, well, 90% of the patient had a history of bleeding. Yeah. Uh, 
80% had what is considered as contraindication to anticoagulation, yeah. whether it's because they had a history of bleeding, but not all of the history of bleeding were yeah. indication, because yeah. you may consider uh, a GI bleeding with obviously some issues with uh, 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 over treatment with VKA plus aspirin is will not reproduce, so it's it's not uh, contraindication. Yeah. Uh, when you consider intracranial bleeding, it's often considered a con as a contraindication to all anticoagulation. So yeah. it's quite different. 90% history of bleeding, 80% contraindication to bleeding. There, there are even some patients with no bleeding, but there are a few patients in our center with Rondu Osler disease, which is considered. Yeah, absolutely. You, you may consider any, they will always be high risk of bleeding, absolutely. even if they do not have. Uh, history of severe severe bleeding and finally very few patients but uh, and it's off level but patient with history of stroke in spite of what is considered appropriate uh, antithrombotic therapies they, they are not the device is supposed not to be reimbursed but it's in some cases quite compassional we have let's say it's five percent of the patient mm. with history of stroke in spite of uh, antithrombotic therapy and uh, so these are these are patients at high risk of bleeding, and the conundrum often in appendage closure is how to manage the anticoagulation afterwards. So everyone ends up on something usually. Yeah. Um, were there many bleeds I in the period after implant as well? Uh, this is uh, the, the the rate of bleeding uh, was, if I remember correctly, it was mm. between ten and twenty percent, and we have to consider bleeding after uh, implant. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, there uh, is yeah. Uh, when you consider even minor bleeding. Yeah, uh, sure. uh, And you have all the scenarios. You you have uh, you may have implant uh, bleeding during the implantation, and there has been yes, a few tamponades, sure. which is clearly related to the procedure, device, yes. to the well, rather to the implantation, oh rather yes, than the to the device. Yeah. And there are some other tamponade which are a bit delayed, uh, which you may consider is rather related to the device and not the implantation. You have also patients with minor bleeding at the site of the puncture or uh, elsewhere, G GI bleeding and even intracranial bleeding. It, what is surprising is these patients are so high risk that you may have patients with bleeding why precisely they had all anti-traumatic therapy which was stopped so they were supposed to be low yeah, risk of replace, bleeding yeah, and yeah, we tried to consider it was the good strategy and anyway they, they, they do bleeding while they, they do not have specifically a, a, a powerful anti-traumatic strategy so it's very high risk and specific mm. patients with profile of risk. Yeah. I think probably one of the most striking findings was actually the patients on dual antiplatelet therapy really did, yeah, uh, did did very well in terms of thrombus formation at least. Yeah, um, uh, what we well we we check out the data and we what we our feeling initially was that patient with no antiplatelet therapy uh, uh, did quite bad and it yeah. it makes sense because it. It's implanting devices. It's yeah. quite like implanting stent, and you may think that at least you may need an initial period of at least one antiplatelet therapy. Yeah. Well, actually, the statistical analysis resulted in the fact that the dual antiplatelet therapy was associated with a, a lower risk of thrombus formation. Mm. Uh, but it, the dual antiplatelet therapy was not commonly used, so I'm not that sure it's it maybe uh, used in, in all of the patients. So probably we will work on the data. The results changed when we, when we had a, an interim analysis at 350 and results were a bit different when we yeah. added 100 patients. So even when we, there, are, it's, well, there are not so many patients in each center, so it's quite difficult and we tried to, to gather many patients in France, 450, it's, it's not that high. Yeah. Uh, but I think we will really have to work together and, and put all the patients together to, to, to try at least, as you mentioned, yeah. not to have definite conclusion, but at least to have a picture yeah. of what may be proposed and hypothesis because we are in a field in which we do not have yes. anything at all. It's a very difficult field. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to clearly to work on that to have a better picture of the problem. Uh, what was the average period of follow-up for this study? Yeah, importantly, it was 11 months of follow-up. Uh, maybe also uh, an important finding and, and to be keep in mind is that the the, uh, the profile of risk of this patient, there are high risk and there mm. are high risk of, of death yes. of, uh, because uh, uh, and, and you, you, you 
cannot consider, considering also the cost of, of the, the device, uh, that uh, it may be so widely implanted because the, when you consider that, that this patient of very frail and, and high risk of events, it's also have to be considered that the general risk of death, of yeah. cardiac death, but non-cardiovascular death is high in this patient with many of them with a history of stroke also. So it's, it's yeah. also to be considered. And I imagine the amount of time people were on deal antiplatelet therapy or the different oral anticoagulants was very variable. Yeah. Do you think there's a minimum period? Were you, did you get a sense for a minimum <laughs> period people needed to be on? I try to work on that because yeah. clearly we, we, we try and, and the Because the, the you model want to get them off ideally, really, yeah. don't you? Uh, the, 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 what we have with patients with atrial fibrillation and coronary artery disease, you, you, you know that the recommendation yeah. with a different period and we try to, 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 to see that, but it's uh, once again, observational study, yeah. highly difficult to deal with this different period. And, and uh, at even trying to, to make a, a relevant subgroup yeah. uh, was a decision. We tried to gather patients with one antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet, oral anticoagulation. These five groups, it was, it was already some problem to, to, to make the subgroup. Period, it is, it, it's, it's uh, even more complicated to try to identify, but clearly we have to work on that. It's, it's a key issue, clearly, but we, we have to have many patients, many follow-up, try to categorize that. It's really difficult, particularly when you consider observational yeah. study. Is there a, do you have your own practice from your own implants? What do you tend to um, do? Well, uh, it may depend. That's the, the, what we find also is that the well, maybe not surprisingly, but for a physician, it, 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 it makes an issue, is that the only difference between patients with the uh, watchman device and those with the Amplazor device yeah. was not related to the clinical characteristics. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it resulted in different antithrombotic management because probably the, the, the design of the study, the historical design were a bit different with, with each of the device. Uh, one with the amplatzer was rather on uh, antiplatelet uh, and a short duration yeah. and, and oral anticoagulation for the watchman. Yeah. So different, so same patient, different device, different, different antithrombotic different management, regime. which is does not really make sense for the, the patient. Same yes, patient as a different antithrombotic, uh, uh, different antithrombotic therapy. So uh, the practice is that we try to have uh, one month uh, or uh, wait, three month or dual antiplatelet therapy, and then we try if it's possible. But patient with a major history of bleeding, I think dual antiplatelet therapy it's very high risk of yeah, bleeding. Absolutely. So it's 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 it's, a, it's really a dilemma. Yeah. Uh, so uh, con saying it does not make sense at all. Probably antithrombotic therapy. The risk is with dual antiplatelet therapy. Yeah. But it's also not on a short period, it's on a long period. So even if you have a powerful antithrombotic management for three months and possibly a high risk of bleeding, but it will be on a short period and you will, you will closely follow this patient for one, two, three months and then you will stop and then on the long term, there will be a benefit in the term of risk of bleeding. So three months, maybe yeah. dual antiplatelet therapy, in case it's not possible because high, high risk of bleeding, maybe only one or yeah, one antiplatelet for yeah, three months. will be the difficult cases, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in some patients, and then after the three months, down to nothing, or then just to one? at the present times when we are uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, we move it's to one. Single, yeah, yeah. Uh, some patient, uh, we try to uh, switch from, as it has been proposed from coronary artery disease and stent implantation, we try to switch from, and it it, it should make sense from antiplatelet, and you you may have appropriate endotelization, yeah. and then the patient gets stable, and then in case it's possible to have uh, a low dose of one of the new anticoagulants, it might be okay in case there is no contraindication. Yeah. Uh, but it's really on an individual basis that we try to, to find the best option. Yeah. And in some cases, no therapy at all after three or six months. Uh, okay. it's, but it's, it, finally, you may, it's 400 patients, but they are all very different patients. Yes, it's, it's quite yeah, difficult. Definitely. Okay, well, Professor Foshi, that was a, a very interesting data and I'm sure the basis for, for, for future study as well. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you.